Okay, so just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. Only those at the podium will be recorded, but uh, afterwards, if you have questions, we'll give you the mic so your answers will be, or your questions will be recorded. Um, so today, uh, we're going to be hearing from Christina Hendricks and David Voigt. Uh, Christina is a uh, instructor at Philosophy and Arts One, and David is the director of digital learning projects at the Faculty of Education, and we'll be talking about open education practices. So without any further ado, Christina. So thank you for inviting me, Will, and uh, whoever else was in charge. Um, I have way more that I could talk about than I have time to talk. So my solution was, I'll just talk really quickly. That's a very bad solution to deal with this sort of situation. but. Um, what was posted as, as what's going to be talked about in this session were quite a few different courses that I've been involved in. And I thought, well, I better talk about all those courses. So here we go. So my, my talk is, is called Open Education from Connectivist MOOCs to UBC because that's my trajectory. I started off taking what, I, what are called Connectivist MOOCs, which I will just explain very briefly, and then talk to you about a couple of those that I've participated in. And then I'll talk to you about a couple that I am being involved in as an organizer and as a planner and running them. But then, through that experience, I have also decided to try to become more open in my teaching at UBC. So, well, I was able to do some of this connectivist uh, online courses last year because I was on sabbatical. So I had lots of time. Well, you know, you also have other things to do. Uh, to do these kinds of, of things, which I don't now so much. Um, so I don't expect this would be everybody's path. So the overview of the talk, on sabbatical last year, I took a couple of open online courses, which led me to helping to facilitate a couple of other open online courses. And the benefits of online discussions and collaborations made me wonder, why don't I open up my on-campus courses too? Um, after my experiences, I really began to wonder about the whole idea of a closed uh, learning management system, that why not put as much as I legally can uh, out into the open, because it just seemed natural. I had gotten so many benefits of learning from other people and collaborating with other people by them putting their things out in the open that it didn't make any sense to me to put most of my stuff uh, for my courses onto a closed LMS anymore. Though I do still have to use it for things like marks, right, and, and students turning in their essays. So what is a connectivist MOOC? I, I said I took a few of these. Um, the term was introduced by Stephen Downs, and I, I have the M in parentheses because not all of these open online courses that I took were massive. So a MOOC is a massive open online course. Some of them were smaller than massive. Um, but a particular style of MOOC is a connectivist MOOC, which Stephen Downs um, was one of the, the, the first people to even create this style of open online course. And the major focus in those kinds of MOOCs is on developing connections between participants uh, to promote learning from each other. And this was the part that really helped me including after the course was finished. So I'll talk about a couple of courses that I took, and these are people that I'm still working with uh, long after the course is finished, and I don't see that ever stopping. So the idea is less on teaching content and making sure that people are getting content uh, in this style of a MOOC, like it might be for some MOOCs that are, are being presented through Coursera with UBC. Some of those might be more focused on content, and you would give quizzes and exams to make sure people were getting that. These are more focused on connecting people and helping them learn from each other. So what the instructor's role is is to facilitate connections rather than acting as the main centralized source of knowledge. Um, and they, they do this in multiple ways, and I'll tell you exactly how these courses uh, worked. But one way an instructor can do that is to um, encourage people to read each other's work and comment on each other's work, to send tweets out saying, here's something really interesting to read that has to do with what somebody else in the course has done. Right? So to really promote what's going on amongst the participants and encourage them to engage with each other. Participants create their own learning goals and decide their own paths through the course rather than the learning goals being decided ahead of time 
and everyone needing to follow those same exact goals and follow the same path all the way through. So again, this might be very different from a, a MOOC that would be offered through Coursera or perhaps Udacity. And then the course is distributed in various places on the web. And this can be a, a bit of a difficulty for some people because you have to go to lots of different places to follow the course. And I, I've put these slides up on SlideShare. I'll give you the link at the end again if you want to follow through on some of these links that I'm providing at the bottom. So just a picture of a course being distributed across the web. This is from a, a video by Dave Cormier about connectivist MOOCs. So the little birds are tweets. <laughs> the little tags are um, hashtags, I think, or possibly they're bookmarks. I'm not sure. There are blogs. And that's where most of the work in the course is done. It's done through individuals' blogs. And those blogs are put together into a blog hub, which I'll show you an example of, where everybody can read all the blog posts from all the participants. But to comment on those blogs, you have to go to the individual blogs themselves. Right? So you have to go to separate blogs. You have to go to different videos, perhaps. There might be um, video recordings of synchronous presentations or other videos that are related to the course. Uh, these things with the um, this sort of uh, table-looking thing is a discussion board. So there might be discussion boards. Um, and what you would do, this green line is supposed to be a path you might choose through the course. You can't possibly read everything. You can't possibly watch everything. You can't possibly see all the tweets that are going on. But what you do is you choose those that are most interesting to you. And then up here you've got a little idea, right, because you read those particular things. You would get different ideas if you read other things. Um, these is, this is a place you might go to if you're interested in connectivist MOOCs, the MOOC Guide. Uh, and again, I'll give you the link for these slides so you could follow up on these later. These are some of the historical connectivist MOOCs that have happened. They have been in existence since about 2008. So these are the ones that have gone on in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. But then there's a new site called Connectivist MOOCs, connectivistmooks.org, which is just focused on which ones are happening right now and in the future. So the other one was the history. This one is on what's happening right now. And here are a few of those. There's one called Exploring Personal Learning Networks, which is actually, I believe, uh, an on-campus course in the Midwest of the US somewhere, but also open up to anyone who wants to join. There's a French one, Effet Durable, which is about sustainability, um, which is all in French, because most of these are in English so far, but slowly we're getting more in other languages. There's Worldwide Ed Online Instruction for Open Educators that has just started, which is about, in a way, teaching these kinds of courses if you want to get involved. And then, of course, how to teach online uh, similar sorts of uh, subjects. So there's lots of these around. And the one that I started with was called ETMOOC, or ETMOOC, which uh, was from January to March 2013. And this was a typical kind of connectivist MOOC in that we had things like um, a uh, synchronous presentation every week, meaning we'd have a speaker, they would give a presentation about a particular topic, and it was about educational technology, using t technology and education. And we could join live, so it would be on something like Adobe Connect or, what's the Blackboard one? Don't remember, huh? Collaborate, yes, that one. And uh, we could all be there at the same time, and there would be a chat going on, or we could watch it later. There would also be a Twitter chat every week, which would be a one-hour discussion on Twitter <coughs> on a particular hashtag. Questions would be asked, and we'd all answer those questions and get into discussions with each other. There would be things to blog about each week, suggestions of things you could blog about according to whatever topic was being uh, focused on that week. Um, though you could blog about anything related to the course. And that was the nice part about the freedom of these kinds of MOOCs is there's no, again, no set path. You don't have to, to talk about what they suggest. You can talk about what you want to talk about. And other people will get excited and interested and begin to play off of that in their own blogs. We also had a uh, Google Plus page so people could engage in, in discussions on that social network as opposed to just being on their own blogs. And I... I always say that at MOOC really changed my life, and it did. I, I, uh, I, like I said, I was on sabbatical, so I had lots of time to do this course. Um, but it changed my life in the sense that I learned 
not just about educational technology, sure, I learned a lot about that, but I learned about the value of having these kinds of courses, of doing all your thinking uh, out in the open and being connected with other people who are interested in similar things. So I found a community of about 20 people who I still converse with regularly who are interested in teaching, um, also educational technology, but just teaching generally, who are teaching, uh, who are also, some of them are in the business sector doing training, so I get interesting perspectives from that end. And I'm also collaborating with some of these people on new research projects, which they're all over the world, right? They're in various places, Australia, New Zealand, uh, England, Europe, and of course here in the Americas as well. And many of them I will never meet, but it doesn't matter because we've gotten to know each other quite well through doing this course together. So that led me to a course that I'm helping to facilitate right now. Because in fact, this one was created by people from ETMOOC. So there's about 20 or 30 of us who decided to put together a course called an open online experience, which is very similar to EdMOOC in the sense that it is about the same sorts of topics and it's designed in the same way. And we just got together and put it together. You know, there's no institutional backing. There's no, it's not like this is sponsored by X institution. It is just a bunch of volunteers who had such an absolutely fantastic experience in EdMOOC that we wanted to give it to other people. And this is for um, educators from K through uh, higher education. So we've got people teaching in kindergarten, people teaching sixth grade, people teaching high school, people teaching higher ed who are participating in this course. Now let me see if this is going to work. Is it going to click me into the internet? Ha ha, yes. Okay, so here's the page. We are not graphic designers. We did our best. <laughs> it is not the most beautiful page, but we are all also volunteers. <laughs> so uh, let me just point you to quickly the learning topics. So these are the kinds of things we're doing. This course runs for 10 months. Um, and we wanted to do that so that teachers who don't have a whole lot of time could take their time to do blog posts and to engage with the material. Um, Whereas EdMOOC ran for three months. This one is 10 months. So we just study one topic a month. We are doing right now connected learning. What does it mean to be a connected educator? In November, we talk about digital citizenship. How can we talk to our students and engage ourselves in being an online citizen in a useful and not problematic way? Uh, in December and January, we're talking about digital literacy. How can we help people become more literate about their online life? March is uh, student-directed learning and digital storytelling. April is the open movement. That's the one I'm in charge of, which is all about open education, open um, uh, access, and OERs and the future of education, apparently. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, what, we, what we did is each one of us decided what section we want to work on, and we are planning the speakers and all of that. So uh, I want to run quickly through the blog hub. So this is what I mean by a blog hub. Everybody who has a blog who's participating in the course gets their blog posts aggregated into one place. And that way, you can go to this one place, click on each blog post, and then read the whole thing and comment on it. So you don't have to go to various places. OK, back quickly to, uh-oh, current slide. There we go, yay. Another one that I took, which I'm now going to rush through, uh, is DS106, which is another kind of connectivist online course. But this one is specifically about digital storytelling. And this one is, is interesting because it wasn't just an open online course in the sense that it is also being held on campus at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. So what these people have done is they've created an on-campus course, and then they decided to open it up to the world and anybody who wants to follow along and anybody who wants to do similar things. And they've got quite a... Um, quite a big following of people who just do some of the assignments on their own and comment on other people's assignments, uh, including the on-campus courses. This particular site 
is extremely interesting because of one thing. I mean, there's, there's many things that I could talk about with DS-106. Digital storytelling meaning things like creating videos, creating images, image manipulation like through Photoshop, um, creating audio assignments. We all just finished a week or two of making radio shows, and I just spent four hours last night broadcasting radio shows on the DS-106 radio. So that was part of digital storytelling as well. But the one thing that I really want to point out about this one is the assignment bank. This is really interesting because all of these assignments are created by students, some of them by the instructors, but the instructors acting as no more, as no different than students insofar as they are creating assignments. So what happens is, in a week where you're talking about design, let's say, the instructor will say to the students, go find which design assignments you want to do and make sure you've got 15 stars worth. So what these stars are is people have said, this is how difficult I think this assignment is going to be to complete. And these assignments, again, are submitted by students, sometimes by instructors, sometimes by people like me who are just joining in for fun. And the students have free choice as to which assignments they want to do. And they just have to make sure they have the right number of stars. Now, who decides the stars? The people who created the assignment. And also, the people who are doing the assignment. If they think the stars are not enough, they can just add some more. So it's a kind of crowdsourcing of the, uh, the difficulty of, the, of what, how many stars you might want to give it. I think this is extremely interesting and something I would like to consider doing in my philosophy courses. So I haven't exactly decided how to do it. Right? OK, so this term, DS-106 is, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> there we go. This term, DS-106, is headless. There is nobody teaching this course. There is nobody teaching it on campus. There is nobody teaching it off of campus. What is happening is there are weekly announcements that are taken from a previous iteration of the course. And volunteers are looking over those weekly announcements, changing the date, maybe, uh, of the things that we're doing, and deciding whether or not we want to add something. Similar to the other course, we're all just saying, look, I'll take a week. I'll do this week. I'll be the one in charge of deciding, you know, do we need to change that weekly uh, announcement? Do we need to add a new resource? And then we might also do something slightly more, like maybe do a, uh, a podcast where we talk about the assignments people are doing. Or last night, like I said, I did four hours of broadcasting people's radio shows on the radio, because DS-106 also has its own internet radio station. So the volunteers are just deciding what we do each week. It's based on what has been done in previous weeks. But there is nobody in charge. And I think that's really interesting. And yet it is still working. I don't know how I would handle that with an on-campus course, but it would be cool. OK, last things. We've got to move to UBC, right? I've just been talking about what I did. I'm not going to have time to talk about Way Open. I'm sorry. <laughs> At UBC, um, I teach in a program called Arts One, and we are doing something called Arts One Digital, which is opening up Arts One as much as possible to the world. And what we are doing is we are allowing students to do blog posts and collecting them in a blog hub, and anybody can read those. We are also inviting anyone outside of Arts One who wants to attach their blog to Arts One to also have their blog posts aggregated into that as well. We are uh, recording all of our lectures for this course and posting them onto online so anyone can watch those. Um, we are putting up all of our essay assignments so anyone could do that as well. And the reason why is because we are also starting with badges this year. So we, we're calling it MOOC right now. I'm not sure if that's going to stick um, because I don't know if it's not really massive and it's not yet a fully open online course. But we do have some badges. We haven't had anybody take us up on this yet, but we have, we've had had some people talk about it. So we've created some badges. You know, here's what you could do to get various badges. You could read these texts. You could write blog posts. You could write an essay. It's very similar to what the students themselves are doing. Nobody's going to get UBC credit, but they might get an interesting badge that they could post on their site. Right? 
So that's really fun. The last thing I'm doing, and again, I told you I was going to rush through this, right, is my own course uh, outside of Arts One, Philosophy 102, which is Introduction to Philosophy. And in this particular course, I'm doing something similar to the Arts One digital site. I am asking students to blog. Now, in both cases, we are letting students, if they choose, have a pseudonym to blog or to make their posts private so that only we can see them. Now, so far, only a couple people have chosen that option. Um, so most people have been able to, have been happy to show their, their real names. But I feel it's important for privacy. So I ask students to blog. On my site, you can see all of the blog posts. Or you can go to each individual discussion section, which is just uh, 25 students. So you're not completely overwhelmed with 100 blog posts on each particular topic. And the students go to each one of these sites, the whatever their particular discussion section is, Friday 9 to 10, and they can read each other's posts here. Now, the other thing that I'm doing with Philosophy 102 is I'm putting absolutely everything legal uh, up on there as public. So I can't put anything having to do with marks or student identification without their permission. But all of my assignments, all of my lecture notes, anything that has to do with the course is all up there public because I have learned so much from other people doing that that I feel it would be not nice to not give back. Now, one drawback to this is everything you do is public. <laughs> So if, you, if you're not sure about what you're doing in your class and you're experimenting and it's not going that well, it's public. Everyone can see it, right? So you've got to be comfortable with that, and I don't have a problem with that. One of my students uh, um, also recently posted something about how the class discussions are going, and it was a bit negative. And that's public. Everyone can see that. Yeah, it's not going very well. But that's fine, because we can all see it and we can all work, for it, work towards fixing it, right? So that's what I've got. Um, next term, I'm hoping to invite people to officially be part of my philosophy course. So people from outside the campus, anybody who wants to actually do it, I want to invite them to, to do it and post their blog posts, possibly do some live uh, presentation sessions that anyone could join into online, and maybe even do Twitter chats if, there are, if there's enough interest. So that's where I'm going. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christina. And uh, I don't know how I follow up that, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, um, I agree with everything that she said and, and even more. I've been kind of committed to the open side of this game for, gosh, eight or nine years now. Um, I've been teaching in the Master of Education Technology program out of the Faculty of Education, which is an international, completely online program for almost 10 years now. And very quickly, I decided that uh, Blackboard wasn't going to do it for me. And so for the last eight years or so, we've been completely online and open in a course called eTech 522, which is about creating ventures in learning technologies. Uh, and so everything I've said, everything the students said, all the content of the course has been open and public for that amount of time. And it has been brilliant. And I haven't looked back. And I don't use the LMSs for anything. Uh, not for you know mark collection or anything of that kind. And so, if any of you want to become homeless like me uh, outside of Blackboard, I'd be very happy to create a you know a support group to figure out how that works. It's very easy to do, and it's totally liberating. And uh, one of the main reasons we did this initially in the course was both to get out of Blackboard, but because the course, which is exploring the future of education, we said, well, how can we do that if we got everybody in a prison? Let's break out. And we actually had the class take us to different learning platforms each week. And so we'd all literally move the whole class from one platform to another platform to another platform throughout the course. The only way you can understand the advantages of different platforms is being there. And so we literally and we're, we're gypsies. And we still have that philosophy of 
moving around, testing things out. Uh, a lot of students find that uncomfortable. Uh, I would say 10 to 20 percent of students come into a course like this and they are extremely happy with the walls created by an LMS and they don't want to be outside of that structure. And they're actually a little bit concerned about having everything they say going up online and being viewable you know, by anybody in, in the open public. They get over that really quite quickly. And in fact, the advantages of being open online are everything that Christina said, so I won't repeat those, but I'll add some other ones. One is that um, uh, we can get immediate response from the world. One of the things that we do in, our, in the course is students are reviewing other ventures that are going outside as part of their activity, and they're posting those. Because they're public, people who are doing searches find those. And so we've actually found within the same two or three days of a student posting a major you know, uh, review of some external site that the person that created that external site or that external platform has blogged on their own post about, hey, this student at UBC is doing this, and then you get cross-fertilization from other networks all around the world. So you're, you feel like you're in this process of instant knowledge creation. Rather than closing off and everybody talking amongst themselves, you're all of a sudden in a much bigger sea, in a much dynamic a much bigger dynamic sea of knowledge creation in the broader world, which is very, very exciting for the students as they get get moving. The other part about open that I think is, is terrifically important is that um, I've found that the conduct of the students has improved dramatically over time for doing that. When they understand that they're in public, they're actually acting more professionally. The products that we get are, are you know, freewheeling, they're, they're spontaneous, but they understand it's as though they are speaking in public. And I've found that the quality of engagement that we're talking about, you know, goes up considerably because of, because of that. And, and I appreciate that portion of it. Um, by the way, I'm not doing any kinds of, maybe I should do you know, animals up here. I'm not doing any kind of digital support because I'm really just talking about three courses. And so you can remember the numbers or look them up. They're all open online. You can explore them on your own terms. So I've just been talking about uh, ETEC 522. And so ETEC 522. And uh, you, can, you can dive in and, and look at the current course. There are 40 students in, in that course right now. And so you can see everything they're doing. You can follow everything they're doing. Um, like Christina, I like to take a, a, a largely hands-off approach. I'm not the sage on the stage at all. I'm setting this, this vehicle in motion. They're creating things. If it goes off course, I'll move it along and so on. But this is about the students actively pursuing you know, collective paths with, within this overall program. Um, the next course I'm going to talk about is one that uh, just launched for the first time this fall. And uh, it's again completely online in the Master of Education Technology uh, program. It's called ETEC 565M. And uh, it is about mobile education and very specifically to, you know, how, what are the uh, evolutionary trends in mobile? How does that, how is mobile moving forward? How do you become a, a master educator using mobile? This is, I think, the first graduate course at UBC that it's entirely mobile first design. You're meant to be taking it on your handheld. You're meant to be taking it on your iPad. You can still have it on your desktop if you want, but the whole thing is designed to be part of a mobile, continuing mobile experience. The difference about this course that we're experimenting, which again is in an open WordPress blog, like eTech 522, is that um, we are looking at a process of continuous knowledge creation. We have something in there called the knowledge mill, which is basically saying that every single thing that you do in this course, which is about you know diving out and understanding, doing critical reviews of of resources, doing critical reviews of how mobile learning applications are putting in, uh, adding your own content uh, in this area. All of this, I see it, is about creating a frontier of knowledge creation which is continuing to move forward. Meaning most courses, 
the philosophy of most courses is as soon as the course ends, you push a button and it flushes. All the content goes away. Uh, what we're saying here is no. What, what the students have created here is actually a brilliant foundation because this isn't about them learning content. This is about them creating content because this is an area that is moving so quickly that if I, as, as the person in charge of this course, decided here's the content, you consume that, it would be out of date before I decide it. So they're actually making this content on the fly. They're doing the fundamental research on the web. They're, they're co-creating this with their other students and they're moving it forward. And what they create at the end of the course is then what the next set of students stand up on and move forward with. And that notion that they're continually building on that, moving forward, moving some things aside, is fundamental to the creation. One of the things we built in this, very much like Christina Starr pieces, is that they, they are reviewing each other's content. Uh, they are actively commenting on each other's content, and their progress is, or their contribution to the course is measured on what they create, what they critically review, and what they comment on. And so they are continually adding to those kinds of, of uh, pieces and each one of those contribution pieces, creation of content, critical review of content, or simply um, liking content in a way, um, is, is part of exposing what you know and adding value to what is already there. And so that is how they are being measured in this course. Um, too early to say if it's a wild success or not because we're only halfway through, another 40 students in that online. Um, it is uh, very exciting. I think it's working very well. Um, the other piece about this course, this brand new course, which is, um, I think, different than, than other courses, is that the major project that they do in this course, which is after they've dived through and discussed and figured out everything to do with mobile education and understanding how mobile learning happens is their major piece is to author something and to author something that is going to be used. And so the last course I'm talking about, M101, uh, which is also in a WordPress blog, is that what they author into. And so we have the M101 blog, which I'm going to describe now, which is a LOOC, um, not a MOOC. Um, a LOOC is is uh, the L is localized or local, which means that it's not completely massively open. Um, this is a, a course that's open to anybody with a CWL password. So that's basically the UBC community. And the reason we wanted to dive into a LOOC more before a MOOC is that we recognize that a lot of MOOCs have a challenge with community cultivation, meaning you don't know everybody there and you have issues with trolls and with people that don't really know why they're there and all the rest of that. And so there's a, there's a lot of problems around basic society that happens in MOOCs, which is, which is uh, not impossible to control at all. There's lots of methodologies for doing that. But we said, let's start with a community we already understand and everybody understands their membership. And you may be a professor, you may be a staff member, you may be an undergraduate student, you may be a graduate, you may be somebody who, who's an alumni. But you're all, you all feel like you belong to UBC. And that number is a huge number. So it's still massive in that sense in terms of all the people that have access to that. But to a certain extent, they all feel uh, a community obligation, which is why we're, why we're doing, doing it in that form. Now, M101 is a course about digital literacy. And, and really, it's a course about building your competencies in digital literacy and certifying those competencies. And so we also have a badge infrastructure going there. And we also are moving, we also intend to move into very dangerous territory of saying, okay, you can do all these activities, um, this, this course, anybody can go on to any time. It is self-directed, it is self-paced, it's really a massively individual online activity. You don't go in 
with a whole cohort. You go in when you want, you do where you go, you can decide what you do, you can decide any learning path you want on your way through it. You're doing exactly the same activities as I described for the 565 course. You are creating content, you're doing critical reviews of content, you are commenting, liking, and so on, other content that you see. That is your participatory activity in, in the course. You're actually finding other content that should be in the course and posting it in. All of those expose your competencies in those areas. Other people are rating that exposure, which enables us to do an, an automated background you know, validation of your work. And very much as Christina says, this thing is meant to run without anybody looking at you. This is meant to run without any you know, professor or anybody else validating anything that you're doing inside. Now, we're, we're in the stage of building it now, so we, we're, it'll be launching to its first set of students in, in January, uh, but you can go online, you can, uh, you can join it and participate in it right now. There are literally hundreds of students already on board but I don't call them students, they're all peers. All of this is about peer communities. And the peers that are on board now are mostly members of the Master of Education Technology community. When we started to launch M101, we said, gee, um, why don't we invite this community of roughly 1,000 people, 300 active students and 700 graduates, and say, you know, do you want to help us create a course? And uh, within a week, we had uh, over 100 students volunteer their time to say, you know, uh, mobile education is so important to us, virtual and uh, digital literacy is so important to us, we, we want to continue our professional development by co-authoring this with you. So I have 100 co-authors, and those co-authors are simply students in the course because they're learning at the same time, because actually when you add a new student, they are a co-author as well. Everybody is a co-author. That's the whole point of, of the exercise. Uh, so where we're going with our open badge framework and this open participation model, which again fits into this larger structure that, you know, they are creating the curriculum. They're creating the content. You are finding your own pathway through this as you're going. Uh, we want to formalize that in the sense that we want these badges to appear on your transcript. That's where we want to go. So right now it will be an informal badge, but we believe we can account the learning, the competencies that are involved in that through the social validation that's going on to enable UBC to absolutely know it has the academic rigor to grant this as a transcriptable piece. Now we're not there yet. All we do is we can see the pathway to get there. And we, we believe this is, this is uh, really important for understanding how uh, a university can transform the kinds of learning offerings it can do. When you think about what digital literacy is about, uh, we all have different parts of it, but none of us really understands how digitally uh, illiterate we are in different areas. Uh, nor do we really understand how we can find pathways to become, in a broader sense, digitally literate. And whose standard do we do? And so the reason for Luke in this area is we're going to set a standard which blends, meshes together the digital literacies of a campus community the size of UBCs and sets the standards based on how that moves. Because we're absolutely confident that across UBC, we have world-class digital literacy stand, you know, competencies in different areas at different times. And if we collect that, we'll have a curriculum, which is collectively co-authored, that is world-class. And that if we can then set that the evolving curriculum is set by that community, anyone can dive in and pursue not only where they're weak, but where they want to grow and how they want to be on top of that. And that is something that I believe a university like a UBC should be doing all the time because um, I've witnessed far too many students jump out of UBC with their, you know, uh, Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Arts or whatever and look around and say, oh, I have to go to BCIT now to get something that makes me employable. Um, and that's, that's a shame. Not that BCIT isn't a great institution, but we provide 
if you want, some real bricks of academic learning, but we don't really have any flexible mortar between those to make that a really solid education. I see courses like M101, which you can take on your own time, between courses, as you wish, which give you world-facing, certifiable competencies which, which companies, organizations, so on, want students to have. So, gee, I've got a law degree, but I'm also an expert in social media marketing, and I'm, I know how to create web pages and all the rest of that. All of a sudden, that's a real bonus on, on, your, on your resume. That's what we're trying to achieve with this. And um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a learning technologies person. Uh, in fact, I spend most of my time off of campus. Um, I, I, I'm running three startups, and I have two research networks uh, that are really about moving these kind of technologies forward in the world. Um, and I think UBC is an ideal place to kind of start implementing these at uh, a higher level. And when I look at what UBC sees as flexible learning, which is a good thing, it's not enough. And to me, Flexible learning is really about the flexibility of the learners and really enabling that, which is what M101 is about. It's enabling their flexibility for them to be agile in a digital world to pursue and gain knowledge on their own rights. But it's also about the flexibility of an institution to provide different avenues for learning that are completely outside of those academic bricks that we know are going to be there forever, but that create a much, saw, a much better foundation for people to move out into the world. And so my fundamental philosophy on, on learning in the modern age, uh, which I'll close on, is that I fundamentally believe that any group of individuals, and I could pick you at random here, uh, either as one person or as a small group, if you decide that you want to become a world expert in any subject, um, all the materials are available online, and uh, all the abilities to, for you to do that are out in the world. If you have sufficient digital literacies and you have sufficient you know, passion to do that, what you don't necessarily have is the ability to get a credit against that, and you don't have the ability to really understand how to connect across communities to, to validate that in a broader sense. All of those things are going to change over the next while. And uh, what we really want to do is enable our learners and ourselves to be able to pursue learning with the agility that, you know, the knowledge in the broader universe that's now available to us. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what I was going to talk about today. So ETEC 522, ETEC 565M, and M101, you can look those up. Um, but that's, that's really, I think, my message, which I hope is pretty complimentary to what you were doing. I think we're open to questions for you now, from you now. So. Thank you. That is fascinating and exciting stuff. I wonder whether you could say a little more about the changing role of the instructor or the professor in this scenario. I mean, you, you've implied a lot, but could you perhaps be a little more explicit? Well, I'll say something briefly and then give it over to Christine who will say something intelligent. Um, I teach only for the opportunity to learn. And I set up all of my courses such that I can send all these very bright people out and research knowledge by setting up programs so they bring it back to me and I can consume it in concentrated, creative, fresh forms. And so for me, it's a total liberation from simply you know, dumping knowledge on people. It's about me riding a wave of learning that I couldn't imagine any other way. I set up courses precisely in the areas that I care about and then I ride that. So in my uh, Arts One course, in Arts One we have um 20 students that we meet with to do discussions every week on a particular book. We read one book a week. And in that particular course, I think of myself more like what David was describing, as, as someone who's just facilitating a place for students to, to learn 
from each other because really what we do in those discussions is I have students um, present uh, discussion questions for everyone to talk about and, and that's all we talk about. Like I don't even have time to say anything besides an answer to their question because they have such great questions. Now how this plays into the open uh, aspect of the course is that they are blogging before the class about those questions. So. Well, actually, they can blog about anything having to do with the text, but they'll often blog about these are the kinds of things I'm interested in about this text. This, this is what I want to hear from people. That's due uh, two days before our, our first class meeting on the book, and so everyone will have a chance to read through those ahead of time, and they'll be able to think about them. And I think that might have helped the fact that there's so much discussion. I don't know if, if it does or not. but. So that's in Arts One. In philosophy, I have to say I have a long ways to go because I have 100 students and it's so hard to, to do very much besides when you've got 50 minutes to stand up in front of class. Now that doesn't say it's not impossible. Um, and I do do a lot of discussion between students in that class. But having the blogs in that class, all I can do is read through them quickly. I, I, it's hard for me to really have students be engaging with each other. I can't keep track of whether they're commenting on each other. That would be you know, 400 comments a week. I just can't do it. So there are some downsides to um, having the larger classes and trying to do any of this. Hi, um, I'm really fascinated by uh, both your presentations. I'm not an educator in, the, in, in that sense of the word. I've homeschooled my kids for a few years, and in that, um, I actually use a lot of online resources, and I'm fascinated with um, what I can actually do online. See, right now, I'm actually looking at learning philosophy and psychology myself, so when I hear what you say, I'm thinking, hmm, if I intend to buy a book and I want to buy it cheap, I go to Amazon.com. But I want to learn about philosophy, I want to learn about psychology, where do I go? So I'm wondering, right now um, learning is really moving and graduate education is moving. Is there uh, one main source where we can actually go and if we don't care about credits and all we want is to continuously learn, is there one like, I don't know, is MOOC the main thing to go to um, and where you can actually have a community of learners together? because. Um, when my kids were homeschooling, the community part is the part that's actually very challenging. So, yeah, they're both in school now, but I wonder where you can comment on um, the graduate education and, you know, where we can find resources and how to find a group to do it. So, um, I think right now we're still in the position of really consolidating all of these resources because I think there are lots of interesting things going on in various institutions. So for example, sure, you could follow along my introduction to philosophy class. You could, most of the readings are free online. I actually picked things that were open, um, except for a few that I had to put on the LMS because I wanted to teach those things and the translations were not, uh, they were still under copyright. Most of the stuff is available for free. Um, and then you can see all of my lecture notes, you can see all of the, the assignments that I've suggested, you can see all the other students' blog posts. I think those kinds of things are going on a lot of places, right? And even further than that, I think some people are making their courses even more things that you could participate in by having some of their own lectures being live and you can follow along or ask questions. You can actually engage in that through a webinar type of format. I think those things are happening. The problem is, where do you find them, right? And right now, the only easy place to find open online courses is through, um, well, I think mostly through the, the third party commercial ventures like Coursera, Udacity. Oh, Coursera, like course, C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A. Uh, Udacity is a U, Dacity. That's in the second one, U D A C I T Y, and then there's also Ed X, E D X. I mean, those are those are some of the main MOOC providers, but they're not. It's not everything, right? And those are only certain kinds of MOOCs. And I, I had on my presentation a list of of current and past connectivist MOOCs, which is a, a whole different type of, of situation. But do we have a place where you can just go see where are all the open online courses in philosophy? Not that I know of. You know, does anybody? And that's that's the beauty of open, 
which is that there isn't one place, because as soon as you get one place, uh, all of a sudden you've got controls on that. So UBC is created with all of its bricks and mortars as one place for learning. And why we're getting into flexible learning now is we realize, oh, that's not a business model that's sustainable anymore because you can get this learning in any number of different places. And so the critical piece is understanding what your learning experience that you want is. Some people just love sitting in a classroom and being talked to or you know, absorbing stuff. That's a, that's a learning model that's completely fine. But if you're very comfortable with online, that's another kind of experience. But do you want to do it together or do you want to do, do it you know, uh, individually? You, so that's again where for me it comes back to digital literacy. Digital literacy gives you the kind of flexibility to pursue lots of different pathways uh, on, on your learning and to understand what pathways are most successful to you. It's not a one, one fits all. I would also say it would be nice if we could have like a wiki that people could just put up their course. Like, here's one. You know, here, I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't have to be controlled centrally, but just yeah. awareness would be cool. I don't know. Um, your examples you both showed were just so fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to one specific thing. It's probably one of the most common objections I hear when people think about moving their courses into the open, and you touched on it. Uh, which is kind of student resistance, that fear of being out in the open. And I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to share how you quite specifically deal with that type of tension and or objection. Um, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, Christina mentioned one piece, which is that some students will say, well, it, it's about my security and so on. So I always give students the ability to create a pseudonym before they, they leap in through their password. Very few of them actually take that up. Those that are comfortable, all I'm saying is don't change your pseudonym every two days because we won't be able to track who you are. But, you know, so yes, you're public, but, but you don't have to be, you know, uh, you have to be somebody, but you don't have to be yourself, if you want to put it that way. But in most cases, um, that the sense of, of being public, um, you know, who isn't? In, on Facebook, who isn't on LinkedIn, who isn't on some other form. People are now public in so many different ways. Uh, I'm finding very, very few people who actually object to, to this learning. Um, I would say, yeah, somewhere between 10 and 20% of students, actually usually less than 10 now, object to this. You know, you can feel the rumblings in the classroom as they start. Uh, but most of it's you know, a sad thing to say is that I'm obliging them to learn, which is I'm obliging them to get out of their comfort of I know how, you know, Blackboard works or I know how this works. I'm saying, no, that's not enough. I want you to learn this new environment. So most of the time it isn't about being open. It's about I'm forcing them to, you know, travel in untrodden territory. Yeah, I would say that I, I, I've just started doing this this past term, and um, so I'm only halfway through, but I was surprised at how little resistance I got. Um, and like I said, it, some people did choose to have a pseudonym. Some people are putting their uh, blog posts under password protection, and they can either choose a class password so everybody in the class could still see it, or they could make their own password and tell me so only I can see it. And, and I've had one person do that. I've had about maybe five or six, maybe more than that, do um, pseudonyms. Um, but in my small class, in my 20-person class, nobody, because they know each other so well. They're working with each other every day for, uh, in various parts of the course, um, and they, they want to hear from each other. And I don't think it would, it would last a pseudonym in a 20-person class. So I have not found very much resistance, but if I would, one of the things I would say is that you know, the, the value of, of being more open, there's various values. One could be that you can have other people from outside the course come and comment on your work, which is what I have found when I've started to blog. And that has been extremely valuable. Not only have I gotten really useful comments and really helpful things to help me improve in what I'm thinking from strangers, but I've also managed to find people to collaborate with. Right? I'm working with someone in Australia on, on a particular research project that I've put off on hold for the moment, but because I wrote about his work on my blog. That can happen to students as well. Um, and, and just a recent example, a student of mine posted something on her blog about 
something that has to do with the campus generally and not just about the, the course, and got called by the student newspaper and the student radio and, uh, and was interviewed by them. And she thought that was the coolest thing ever, right? Because what she had to say was taken up and, and used by others as something very important. And it didn't just go to me, right? So those kinds of things are, might be examples of what I talk about. Mm. Well, one thing I'll add to that, which I'm finding an interesting phenomenon that if you're used to an LMS you've never seen before, and it's a little disconcerting along these lines, and that is students own their content. In, in an open blog, and you know, so I'm finding that I'm I've got student examples coming from you know three or four you know terms ago that I'm bringing up as an example. All of a sudden, it disappears because they blogged it. Well, they can remove it, and that's a good thing. Um, and they can also change it, right? And so over the time, I'm finding students going back and cultivating their presence in a course they took two years ago or a year ago or even what they did two or three weeks ago. And it's past the point where it's being marked, but they are still cultivating their presence, which is a very healthy thing to do online. So, uh, and you'd never find that inside a locked LMS because you're not allowed to touch the content. It's not even owned by you. So it's a, a really interesting piece. Well, on behalf of everyone here, I just want to thank you so much for bringing up these uh, really great topics. I really enjoy the idea of a headless course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.